ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the December ISOMI webinar. Good evening for all the people of European African time zones. Good afternoon to the Americans. Good night for our Asian attendees. This is General Dan from Legnano near Milan, Italy, and I'm so happy to moderate this interesting webinar. First of all, I would like to say thank you to Bracco for supporting us in this initiative. So I'm not alone today with uh, me as a co-moderator. I'm pleased to have uh, Pinar Yelmaz, Turkish uh, physician currently located in Holland. Pinar, microphone is yours. Thank you for your kind introduction, uh, Gennaro. Uh, the webinar tonight will give an overview of uh, current applications of machine learning in hybrid imaging and discuss potential future developments in this interesting area. I'm glad to introduce our speaker today, uh, Sergio Gatidis. He is a radiologist uh, at the Department of Radiology of the University Hospital in Tübingen in Germany, uh, with Greek roots, uh, proudly. Uh, he studied medicine and mathematics at the Eberhard Karl University, also in Tübingen. And he's currently responsible for the hybrid imaging uh, facility at the University Hospital in Tübingen. His focus of research lies in clinical hybrid imaging studies and the development of techniques for the analysis of multiparametric imaging data, from PET-CT to MRI to PET-MRI, which will be enlightened during this webinar. He's also responsible for the medical image and data analysis group of the radiology department uh, in his uh, uh, university hospital, uh, investigating the use of machine learning uh, methods in clinical radiology. We are very happy that Sergius will share his experience on this interesting topic in combining techniques today. Dear attendees, if you have any questions, please write them in the Q&A box and we will discuss these at the end of the webinar. Sergius, please share your screen and the floor is yours. Thanks to both of you for the kind introduction and welcome everybody to this webinar today, tonight or this morning, depending on when you are. So the title is, is uh, of the seminar is Machine Learning in Whole Body Multiparametric Hybrid Imaging. And the first question you might have is why specifically AI or machine learning for hybrid imaging? Why is this topic so special? For once, of course, this is what I'm working on. So it's interesting to me, but of course there are also other reasons. And the main reasons are as follows. First of all, I would argue that hybrid imaging is perhaps the most complex clinical imaging modality, because it's actually many modalities that come together in different kinds of scanners, for example. So from PET-CT, SPECT-CT to PET-MRI, you can have different combinations of modalities, of imaging modalities, and thus you can have numerous different parameters that you measure using hybrid imaging. For example, anatomy in CT or MRI, but also blood flow, perfusion, glucose consumption using FPG PET, for example, or diffusion weighted imaging and so on. The list is really long. And this means that your data that you acquire are not 2D, not 3D, but often 4D because you have different parameter dimensions and many times also five dimensional because you also have a temporal resolution. And this makes imaging really complicated and complex and difficult also to analyze, not only when doing research, but also in a clinical setting. The other reason is, I would say, very simple. We have uh, many, many images in hybrid imaging. And if you look at this PET-MR examination, that's a standard whole body PET-MR examination, how we perform it here in Tübingen. Uh, that's a young girl with, with a tumor here, a osteosarcoma of the left humerus. And this is a normal staging examination where whole body sequences are acquired. The PET is acquired. The MRI part is acquired with different sequences and also organ-specific sequences. And you can easily have 10 to 20,000 single 2D images that you have or you should look at when reading. So this makes also the analysis of these images very time consuming. And this makes also the application of machine learning or AI so attractive in this field. Before we get into the details, I would like you to think about where you think we are at the moment in the year 2020. Perhaps you already know a little bit about machine learning and about hybrid imaging. So what do you think? Is machine learning only of scientific interest in hybrid imaging? Is it being used to solve technical challenges at the moment or already to assist us in clinical analysis? Or 
has machine learning taken over the job of the imaging specialists? I think for most of you, um, you have a good feeling on where we are at the moment, but it will be interesting to look back at in some years and watch this recording and think about it again. So I will ask you the question in the end again, and you can see whether you have um, gotten the information you need to be able to assess this. All right. So my talk will be structured around these pipeline or this pipeline and these steps, these processing steps that um, are related to acquiring hybrid imaging data. It starts with, of course, acquisition and reconstruction of the image, which also includes planning of the examination. Then associate with it, but in the next step, the images are processed. And in the end, the analysis is performed and a report is made or some kind of statistical analysis in a research context is um, done. So I will start with the technical parts, acquisition and processing, and then also show you some aspects of image analysis and also of clinical image analysis, which is, I think, important. Before I start with the concrete aspects, just for those of you who are not too familiar with uh, the deep learning methodology, I want to make a few things simple for you because in reality, they are not too complicated. It's just that the presentation sometimes seems complicated. So there are two kinds of deep learning architectures that are relevant um, for most of the papers that we read and for most of the studies and applications. The first one is a conventional convolutional neural network, which means that the input is an image, and then there are some processing steps, and the output is either a number or different numbers, in the regression, or a class, for example, that there's a tumor in classification. So often when you see the diagrams of these neural networks, the architecture diagrams, they are like a pyramid. And then there is the other architecture that is often shown in these kind of studies or applications, which is an encoder, decoder architecture. This means the input is an image, then there's some kind of computation and in between a latent space, which is just a mathematical object, and then the opposite computation more or less again, resulting in an image again, not in a class or number. And you can imagine that, especially in hybrid imaging, where we have different imaging modalities working together, this can be very relevant, as I will also show. And this is sometimes also depicted in this kind of V-shape or U-shape, but means basically the same thing. So just for you as a heads up to know what we're talking about in some of the um, slides I will show. Okay, so let's start with the technical aspects of acquisition, reconstruction, processing. And there are some um, specific points I would like to stress. Uh, the first one is attenuation correction. This is, seems, or this seems at least to be a technical aspect and not so interesting in general, but for hybrid imaging, it's very relevant. So this is why I will um, take some time to explain it. Image reconstruction, of course, which is also relevant in other topics like MRI. Acceleration of imaging. This is important because hybrid imaging modalities still need quite a lot of time to be performed. So in PET MRI, if you think about the whole examination, a whole body examination, it may take up to one and a half hours. And also important because we're dealing with examinations that are associated with radiation dose, dose reduction. So the reduction of tracer dose that we apply in the nuclear medicine part of hybrid imaging. Okay, let's start with attenuation correction. And just let me just briefly explain the concept. When you perform, for example, a positron emission tomography examination, you inject a tracer, that's a radioactive substance which accumulates in the body and you measure how the distribution of the tracer is within the body by having detectors outside the body. Now, the problem is that events that come from inside the body um, have some way to go through the body. So the signal that you actually measure from coming from the middle of the body is lower than it, it actually is in reality. And you underestimate the signal that comes from within the body. This needs to be corrected in order to have good qualitative results. And in PET CT, it's very easy to just take the corresponding CT because CT already gives you density estimates. So this directly translates into this attenuation of, of the radiation. And by some mathematical miracle, you get a corrected version of the image where the relative um, signal from the body is corrected and you can actually measure quantitative parameters in PET. Similar things are also done for SPECT imaging. So now in PET-MRI, you can imagine you don't have a CT, you only have an MRI. And MRI 
gives you proton density or similar um, information. So how would you do this? How would you perform this attenuation correction in PetMRI then? And here machine learning can be really, really helpful. And this might seem uh, to be a, quite a complicated diagram, but it really isn't. It's a basic concept of how these methodologies are um, translated into clinical practice. So let me lead you through this paper step by step. What is done is there's a training step where pairs of MR images and CT images are available. And they are fed into a machine learning algorithm, which learns to, you remember the structure from before, translate the MR image into the corresponding CT image. And this is done during training. So this network learns to do exactly this. And then during testing, that's the blue box, you get this MR image and you have learned how to produce this pseudo CT. You produce it and you use it for attenuation correction of your PET data. So instead of having directly the CT data, you can learn how to translate MR data into CT data by this deep learning framework. And this actually gives very good results. So for um, head examinations, uh, neuro PET, you get um, errors of below, well below 10% or even less um, using this kind of method. But you can go even further. This is something that we do in Tübingen. You can ask, uh, do we need MRI at all then? So can we just use the non-corrected PET and try to learn how to infer a CT from this non-corrected PET? And actually, this seems to be possible. So what you can do is you can take pairs of non-attenuation corrected PET images and the corresponding CT of PET CT examinations. You can train again an algorithm to translate this non-corrected PET data into the corresponding CT data here um, at whole, using whole body data. And then this combined information can be used to um, recover the attenuation corrected PET. You may ask, do we need this really? We, we Most of the time we have an additional CT. And the answer is yes, there are situations where this can be useful. For example, in PET MRI, of course, where the CT is not available or in PET only scanners, which however are rare nowadays. But there are also other aspects. For example, in this case, you see that it can be the case that the CT and the PET data are not perfectly aligned to each other because they are acquired sequentially in the scanner, not simultaneously. So for example, the liver dome may be at a different position when acquiring CT and PET. And what happens if you take the original CT, which was acquired in a different breathing position, you get this banana artifacts where the attenuation correction goes wrong in these regions due to the missing or the wrong overlap. If you, however, take a synthetic CT, which was generated by the PET data themselves, then you get um, a perfectly fine image without these artifacts. So there, there are situations where if the CT is corrupted by any kind of artifact, motion artifact or metal artifacts, for example, this kind of method may help a lot also in a clinical setting. Then the next step is um, to ask, how can we Hello, um, um, the, uh, the speaker uh, has experienced uh, some uh, technical issues. Uh, we are uh, uh, trying to reconnect it. Hello, Sergios. It's okay it's now. Okay, now we can, uh, we can see and we can uh, hear you. So, okay, you can uh, restart uh, the, uh, the lecture. So let me go to the slide where I was.
Okay. Perfect. So, um, so I will start again from this slide in order because I don't know where you lost me. So the next question basically is how can we enhance pet images? And here the question is how can we reduce our tracer dose? So the tracer dose that we administer to the patients to a lower extent, to a lower amount, and then recover the information by using deep learning. And there are studies that try to solve this problem also by using this kind of V-shaped encoder decoder structure of the algorithm where the input is a low dose image and the output is a simulated high dose image, which is trained by looking at pairs of low dose and high dose images. And it's quite impressive how the quality of the recovered images, how good the quality of the recovered images can be. So in this case, I think it's hard to distinguish which of both of the two is the original image, the high dose image, and which one is the um, recovered uh, image by deep learning. And it will be interesting to see how low we can go. So at the moment, it's possible to get a PET um, image will be low one millisievert of radiation dose from the PET. And I think within the next years, we will see those between 0.5 or even 0.1 millisievert. And this of course means that there will be a broader applicability of um, hybrid imaging, especially of PET also in young children and pregnant women, for example, where dose really matters. And the last slide with respect to the technical aspects is really the combination of everything I said before it is the attempt to really recover the images, the PET images in this case, from raw data. This may be also transferable, of course, to spec images, for example. And here, the network, the deep neural network is used to basically take the raw data, the PET cyanogram as an input, and then again through this um, encoder decoder structure, recover the reconstructed PET image. The training is again performed by having pairs of raw data and traditionally reconstructed data. And the algorithm actually learns to do all the process from reconstruction, attenuation, correction, and showing the image. So this is quite impressive. And I think we will see more data and more studies with this respect. Okay, so much about um, the aspects of reconstructing nuclear medicine data. But as I said before, one very important aspect is accelerating MRI because MRI is the bottleneck when it comes to the duration of examinations in PET MRI. So the PET part itself can take 10 to 20 minutes with new technology, maybe even faster, but MRI takes quite a long time. So one hour, one and a half hours sometime for a whole body examination. And here, to those of you who deal with MRI, this will be um, something that is known. And to the others, it's a similar concept as described before for PET reconstruction, just tailored for MR raw data. And the idea here is to measure only part of the MR raw data, so only part of the case space, that's the acquisition space of MR data. And by measuring only a small part of the case space, you can accelerate your um, acquisition twofold, fivefold, sometimes tenfold, depending on your data structure. What happens then is that you get these strange artifacts, these folding artifacts and ghosting artifacts, um, which are results are the result of having an undersampled case space. But we can, what you can then do is again train an algorithm to basically translate this undersampled corrupted image and create this good-looking version of it by showing in the training process pairs of these kind of data of corrupted data, artifact corrupted data and fully sampled good looking data. And in the next step, in order to ensure a data consistency with the originally acquired data, you can basically combine the case space from the reconstructed data, from the artificially reconstructed data with the originally acquired data and then get a full, fully sampled case space and reconstruct an image. So you have done both, get, got, written, got rid of the, um, of the artifacts and also made sure that you have data consistency. And I hope that, uh, especially for PETMR, we will be able to get the examination times down to well below one hour using similar techniques already in the near future, because this is already something that is available uh, in clinical scanners and will be increasingly used um, over the next years.
Okay, so much about the technical parts of hybrid imaging and machine learning. And now the question of course is, how far are we with respect to image analysis? And what I can say already is that this seems to be much more complicated than the technical part, because there are some aspects to it that cannot be controlled that easily. And I will talk a little bit about lesion detection. So the, the easiest way or the, the most basic way of analyzing an, a medical image, detection of pathologies, of outcome prediction. So trying to use images as a biomarker and also about the applications of machine learning for clinical research in hybrid imaging. Okay, so um, there have been a lot of, have been done a lot of work on automated analysis of PET images, analysis of PET images over the last 10, 20 years. But it was only an, until recently that um, just by using exactly these kind of deep learning methods, it was possible to um, solve this problem to a greater extent. And this is a paper from last year where this was shown um, using a quite a clever methodology. So what was done here, the authors used a lot of manually labeled training data where radiologists sat down and labeled the single lesions towards whether they are malignant or benign. And then the algorithm learns to classify this, uh, these lesions. And the intelligent part about this um, specific paper is that the segmentation was not performed directly, but first a threshold was used to segment all lesions that are above a certain um, tracer uptake. And then a classification step is um, uh, used subsequently. And by doing this, you can include prior information, which is that you know already that malignant lesions should have a higher FDG uptake than the average uptake of the body. And here you can see that this works impressively, impressively well. So you see that, for example, the heart, which has a physiological FDG uptake, is highlighted as benign, whereas the lymph node metastasis and the mediastinum are highlighted as malignant. And there's no limit to the fantasy about, or the creativity about what you can do, of course, with this kind of methodology. And here's just one example, one recent example, using exactly the described methodology. And the authors here looked at patients with non-Hodgkin lymphoma, with um, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, and they analyzed these patients by automated quantification of the total tumor volume, and also the total tumor glycolysis, which means the total basically uptake of tracer of uh, glucose in the tumor. And they could show that um, both the total volume and the total tumor glycolysis have a prognostic effect. So here you can see on the left side, the results from automated tumor segmentation, on the right side from manual tumor segmentation for the same patients. And you can see basically identically that patients with a lower tumor volume and a lower um, tumor glycolysis have a better um, progression-free survival and a better overall survival. So I think this is where the whole field is um, headed to. We will be able to use quantitative biomarkers using machine learning in hybrid whole body hybrid imaging to have a more precise and quantitative assessment of the patient situation. Um, in addition to using the known clinical markers, for example, in the case of um, lymphoma, the ANABA staging system, which is, however, only semi-quantitative. Um, one aspect that I would like to address at this point is that we need to be able to trust these algorithms and to be able to understand how and why they come to the conclusions um, that they come to. And this is often referred to as explainable AI. So we need to be able to explain what the algorithm does. And here is a very interesting paper, I think, where for a task that is difficult also for experts, with experts which is um, diagnosing Alzheimer's disease in FTG pet of the brain, a neural network is trained to do exactly this with, um, I would say, very good precision, as you can see here. And also, this algorithm is tweaked in a way that it gives information about which, which regions of the brain were relevant to, in order to make this decision. And these are so-called saliency maps, which basically show, basically show the importance of different brain regions um, for the assessment of this disease. And you can see here, for example, the particular lobe, there is some 
more importance and this is already known clinically to be an important site. So this is consistent with the knowledge that you already have. And it will be very important, in my opinion, to always have this kind of explanations and saliency maps, for example, or other methods of explaining what the algorithm does in order to be able to really um, trust the results and to understand when something goes wrong. So much about clinical applications, but what about research? What about um, clinical research and imaging research in whole body hybrid imaging? And I found this also very interesting study from about a year ago, where the idea is to be able not only to assess pathology and abnormalities in a single patient, but to be able to perform statistics and analysis across a number of different patients. And what the authors did here is they used PET-MR data where the MRI data, so the fat and water fractions of the Dixon imaging and MR data were used and registered to each other. So all patients in the end have the same size and anatomy more or less after this registration. And then the PET um, can also be registered using the same deformation field as shown here. And in the end, this means that for every voxel in, a, in the ideal case of the image, you can do statistics across a number of patients, not only within a patient, very similar to what neuroscientists have been doing for many, many years. And you can perform statistics, for example, you can tell whether a certain region is abnormal in a patient compared to the uh, same region in other patients. And this is done exactly here where tumor lesions that have a high FTG uptake are shown as abnormal in this patient. But you could also think about assessing, for example, physiologic glucose uptake in the muscle or in the adipose tissue in patients with diabetes compared to control patients. So uh, there are a lot of options how to use this kind of methodology. And I'm sure we will see um, more studies towards this direction in the coming year. Okay, so let's go back to the initial question. Um, where do you think where we are today? And I would say that it's pretty clear that machine learning is already part of uh, hybrid imaging, but mostly in aspects that we do not see directly when we deal with hybrid imaging. So it's in the scanner software, it's in the reconstruction algorithm, it helps to accelerate images, to improve images. And we're just getting started in using machine learning as an assisting tool that helps us analyze images, for example, by automated detection and segmentation of images and quantification, for example, of tumor volume. But this is still something that is not as robust as um, we would like it to be. So uh, there's a lot of um, need for further research in the machine learning domain, but also in the medical image domain. And um, of course, machine learning has not taken over our job yet, but um, who knows what will happen in the future, we can discuss this. Let me summarize uh, my talk and give an outlook. So the current situation as I try to lay out is that machine learning is used mainly for technical purposes in hybrid imaging and will be used also for technical purposes in the future. And I, will, uh, I think it will be very interesting to see, for example, how fast hybrid imaging can be and with how low, how, how um, uh, how low we can go with the tracer dose in hybrid imaging and in nuclear medicine in general. Uh, emerging applications are clinical machine learning um, uses, for example, for lesion segmentation or outcome prediction. And in the future, we can expect to see fully automated analyses of hybrid imaging studies using machine learning and using basically hybrid imaging as quantitative biomarkers, similar to how we use laboratory tests, for example, at the moment. So for just a few seconds, let's go back to the questions whether AI will replace us. I think uh, nobody really uh, fears this. This was different in the beginning of, of the deep learning um, revolution. Now I think people have realized that AI will help us to take over jobs that require a lot of creativity to solve unstructured problems, to talk to patients, and to get rid of jobs that we actually do not want to do, for example, tedious lesion segmentation or routine tasks that um, we can outsource basically to our machine learning algorithms. And with that, 
I'm already at the end of my presentation. I would like to thank you. I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you, Sergios, for your interesting lecture and also the questions about machine learning, robots, if they will replace us or not, is always on fire within our community. Uh, I still uh, remain uh, you know, the concept uh, that uh, radiologists uh, uh, using uh, machine learning and AI will replace radiologists uh, don't use AI <laughs> and machine learning. Um, it's a wonderful uh, phrase I found uh, last year uh, in, uh, in uh, some discussion. I don't remember exactly when. So um, we are collecting some uh, um, questions uh, in, uh, in our question and answer box. Uh, currently, we don't have yet uh, any questions. So I would like to start with a general uh, consideration by me. Um, how is important uh, in uh, uh, creating uh, hybrid imaging and uh, developing hybrid imaging the uh, source of this imaging. I think about uh, the uh, machine, the hybrid machine. I I suppose it's uh, easier for you to uh, elaborate the uh, the uh, images from uh, one uh, scanner, uh, despite to uh, try to take uh, CT from uh, a, a scanner. PET from another one, uh, MRI from uh, uh, a tired uh, machine. Uh, I also think about uh, uh, PET MR uh, scanners. There, there are a few, unfortunately, not so uh, diffused like uh, PET CT scan. So, if I understood correctly, the question is whether um, having hybrid scanners is um, can be replaced or alternative is to use different scanners, PET only scanner CT and MRI scanners and look at the images retrospectively. Uh, I think this is something that uh, becomes really realistic, um, especially using uh, machine learning tools because the main argument always was the registration is not good enough. It is difficult to take an MRI from a standalone MR scanner and fuse it with the PET image because the patient uh, moves in between but this is exactly what what machine learning algorithms are good at in um, finding common patterns in images and also find appropriate um, fusions between images and although the conventional registration algorithms are perhaps not good enough the new upcoming machine learning algorithms um, will i think make it possible to have a near perfect retrospective fusion also for whole body imaging in the near future. So we have to think again about um, if we really need um, integrated scanners in this context. However, there are of course other aspects to having integrated scanners that are really important. For example, the short examination time, more comfort for the patient, a better um, yeah, throughput. So it's not only about image fusion, it's, it is also about um, having a perfect or, or better setup in, in general. Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe Penar, uh, do you want to say something? Yes, thank you very much for uh, your nice presentation. I see that there is one question in the chat box now, and I also have a question afterwards. Um, so the question uh, from Saif Afat is, are you using some of these AI solutions in cl clinical routine? Yes, yeah, so um, as I try to point out, many of the technical aspects are used basically under the hood in the clinical routine, for example, for reconstruction of MR images or for generation of attenuation correction maps in PET-MR. With respect to the clinical tools, no, we are not. That's the reality still. It's still something that is used for studies and is being evaluated. Um, but at the moment, we do not have tools that are easy to use in a clinical setting. And also, sometimes we don't have the hardware that might be 
necessary to apply these neural networks in a clinical setting. But um, I think the methodology is there, so we can hope to see clinical applications within the next few years. Thank you. I also have a question related to that because I, I, uh, I was thinking of what, are, what is your vision on the next steps of translating these computing methods into the clinical tool, in clinical tools for hybrid imaging? I know you can do multiple PhDs on that, but is there yeah. a specific sub uh, field or area in which you say, okay, this is something we can definitely uh, use in the upcoming year years? Yes, so I think what will happen and what I hope will happen is that we will incorporate this quantitative biomarkers that we get from hybrid imaging also into our clinical studies and subsequent, subsequently, of course, in our decisions that we make clinically. You know that nowadays we use um, things like the Deauville score or um, clinical staging systems in order to make clinical decisions. And these are used because they have been proven in clinical studies to be useful. So if we start now using for example, total tumor glycolysis or number of lesions or lesion volume as markers in our clinical studies, we will then see that some of these parameters are equally or even more helpful in a clinical setting. So we will start using them as a standard. And also for therapy response assessment in oncology, that's very important. If we think about a persist or resist criteria at the moment, they're really semi-quantitative, really difficult to assess. You only look at single lesions. So this will be something that um, will be very important to be able to look at all images and all lesions at the same time, and not only at a few target lesions, for example. This is my vision in the near future for the clinical application um, of these modalities. And this will be also in the report. And I think- Yes, yes. I think before, if uh, we start doing this, oncology. our colleagues, oncologists and other colleagues will start asking for it. Thank you. Um, another question in the chat box is um, uh, from Luc Guido. In creating new images from other modalities or undersampled case space or cinegrams, how can one ensure the virtual images are not only realistic looking, but also accurate enough? Yeah, that's a very, very good question. And actually, you can, of course, create artificial good looking images from without any data, just from noise. So, so that's uh, uh, really relevant. You need to be able to ensure some kind of data consistency between your raw data and the image that you create. And um, there are two ways to do it. The first way is to be able to give some kind of technical um, assurance that this is the case, some theoretical insight that this is the case. And the other way is to perform large scale studies to look at whether you miss lesions or not. But this is nothing new. So if you think about, let's say, different imaging modalities, if you perform a study and try to find out whether you see lung lesions in MRI that you see also in CT, it's the same question. Can I use MRI, for example, to see the relevant lung lesions? And you can ask the same question by saying, can I use only 1% of tracer dose to have a good staging in, let's say, Hodgkin lymphoma? at the initial diagnosis. So there are these two aspects to it, having technical um, insights that give you a guarantee and having studies that prove that also clinically um, you get the information that you need. Okay, also, thank you. Uh, and uh, I am so curious, curious and so interested in the accelerating MRI because uh, it's, uh, it covers many, many aspects of our, uh, our uh, professionals. Uh, I also think about uh, uh, critical patients uh, and uh, MRI will be all uh, more and more uh, used uh, in, uh, the, in this type of patient and also patient with the claustrophobia. I am a claustrophobic <laughs> patient uh, and so uh, to know that uh, we can uh, accelerate <laughs> the uh, the sequences uh, on MRI, uh, I think it's uh, wonderful uh, for me as a patient, uh, uh, for me as a physician, and uh, also for the critical uh, care patients. Yes, I think that uh, this is one aspect that um, not is not talked about very often in a scientific context, but 
the accessibility of hybrid imaging is really, really important. Not only the, um, the comfort for the patient, but also cost, tracer dose and radiation exposure. And um, basically PET-CT and PET-MR are perfect imaging modalities for many questions, but we don't use them because of these reasons. So just think about if we were able to acquire a PET-CT in five minutes, PET-MR in 15 minutes, and this is not unrealistic. This would change the game of how we perceive hybrid imaging. At the moment, I think hybrid imaging is still seen as a niche um, and not as a you know working horse in, in imaging, but this will, I think, change in the near future. It's a wonderful, it's one of the uh, most interesting uh, part of our, uh, our profession. So I think uh, uh, that uh, we are uh, no more questions. Um, also, take a look. Uh, of the, yes, uh, questions are over. So uh, if uh, for my co-moderator, uh, if my co-moderator agree, we can uh, conclude this uh, really really interesting uh, webinar about um, uh, hybrid imaging with uh, Sergios Gatidis so uh, the uh, microphone is for uh, PNAR for the conclusions and for the dissertation. Thank you very much. Um, thank you uh, again Sergio for this very interesting topic and uh, thank, thank you for, for inviting me. Um, as you say I think we should see this much more often in the clinics. Uh, I think one of the things are the costs costs of uh, these images uh, that uh, puts us back in the clinics. But uh, I think with uh, these amazing research results and hopefully with machine learning helping us, this will uh, change in the future. So thanks again. Thank you for all the attendees. And I want to thank, uh, thank Rocco again for sponsoring us to uh, make this webinar possible. So have a great evening, everyone, and hope to see you uh, at our next webinar. Okay, see you. you. Bye. Bye. Bye.